um, American Indian activists for almost the first time joining mainstream America protests, not specifically, uh, you know, Indian protests about the way they were treated, the way the Bureau of, Ind- of Indian Affairs was cheating them, about the the, the way that uh, treaties were being broken and had been broken for years and years. Uh, and they took over Alcatraz, and they took over the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and then they took over uh, Wounded Knee. And it mm-hmm. was a battle. It was a battle. I mean, um, the, shoot- the amount of shooting, the amount of... Uh, uh, people, the amount of armored personnel carriers, the it, it just was stunning. Well, and and the, odd, was the oddly seen. interesting thing I found was that almost everyone um, was a Vietnam veteran, because most Indian males um, joined the military. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's just a, it's almost an absolute. And whether it's some uh, some. Um, cultural bias or whatever, but they're extremely patriotic um, to the United States of America, and they almost all joined the military. Um, so, And then you had the U.S. Marshals, which was primarily made up of uh, special forces and A-teams. I mean, mm-hmm. it was uh, made for an odd, odd, odd relationship. Well, I, I think I can... Uh... I mentioned you were talking about the uh, uh, Native American males, uh, the, and I mean the name of your book is Warrior. Yeah. Well, it, it kind of went along with Courier, but um, yes, it's the continuing story of a uh, Vietnam veteran named uh, Rick Putnam, mm-hmm. uh, who is tortured by the memories and the, the emotional effect of Vietnam, and well, we now know is PTSD, mm-hmm. except in 72 and 73, um, the re- and I was not a veteran, I, and I was not an Indian, so, you know, outside of all of this. Um, but the people I knew were desperately coming back and trying to make uh, normal lives and trying to work out ways to to get back into society. They were not... Uh, ramboing off into the woods and being crazy uh, in those days. And he has been trying to work his way back in, but what he's found is that the only way that he can achieve the clarity that um, will drive the the memories and the demons and the faces of the dead and the moments out of his head uh, is to ride a motorcycle at the fastest possible speed because um, I don't know if anyone's ever done that. I have. <laughs> it <laughs> requires every every bit of uh, every bit of your I can't say your brain. It requires every bit of everything mm-hmm. you've got, and then you finish. You don't. You haven't thought about anything. I mean, I did some some car racing. I did a lot of motorcycle riding. Mm-hmm. And at the end, man, you felt good because you hadn't thought about anything. There are no worries. There's no money. There's no, you know, anything. And that's what he uh, does. And to do that, mm-hmm. he got a job as a motorcycle courier for ABC. Uh, well, I'm sure I, man, I shouldn't have said that. ABC, <laughs> American Broadcast Network, which was my clever way of covering up the fact that I was talking about American Broadcasting Network, where I was a courier, mm-hmm. um, but uh, and he was uh, in the first book. He was carrying the news, and he picked up a piece of news that uh, all of a sudden had a kill team on his trail trying to murder him to get back the information. Mm-hmm. And at the end of that book, after they had resolved it, and you just have to read that book. They yeah. he ended up on the uh, with his. Uh, this woman that he had finally, who had finally broken through his shell enough that he would let her in and loved her, um, up on the Northern Cheyenne Indian Reservation. And uh, when they came out, the obvious uh, for me, it's 1973, it was April, obvious place for me, uh, yeah, April, 
was uh, wounded knee. That's where they would mm-hmm. have gone. That's where she would have stopped because they were. Uh, she was working with the American Indian Movement. Well, I want to talk about uh, the two primary characters, Rick and Eve, some more. But uh, I want to clarify a couple things here about the wounded knee uh, siege. Um, that also had to do with uh, the coal industry or uh, coal deposits. Can you, just briefly, can you bring that up and let us know what well, that was Well, let's about? put it this way. It does in my book uh, on a very explicit level, and my book is fiction, mm-hmm. and I do believe that it had to do... I mean, the history of the American government and the Indian reservation since... 1800 when they started doing it has been a history of let's give them the most worthless land we can find oh my goodness there's something on it like oil well we'll take it back Mm -hmm. or oh my goodness there's something on it like uh, gold in the black hills we need to take it back and what was going on in the early 70s was that they were discovering as an energy crisis was just beginning that uh, Montana, South Dakota um, in that area was on top of the largest soft coal formation in the world, the mm-hmm. Fort Union. Uh, and um, I can't remember the name of the river, Tongue River. Um, coal deposits, which are about 10 feet down, easily strip mineable, uh, and now uh, are large uh, polluted pits in the ground. And um, you know, I don't know if you could find a direct link the way I did in the book, but I don't think it's any doubt that there's an indirect link between moneyed interests who wanted to build coal plants mm-hmm. and the uh, sort of, boy, isn't it convenient to build them right on top of the Indian lands and, uh, you know, rip off the upper level of their land, which is rather important to them. The Northern Cheyenne in 73, about... Uh, within this period, within a couple of weeks of this period, refused, for the first time ever, uh, refused all coal loans, uh, uh, leases. Mm -hmm. They refused to allow their coal to be mined. To the intense shock of the uh, Interior Department and the Bureau of Affairs. But as it turned out, um, they... They were uh, absolutely right because they were the Bureau of Indian Affairs had sold this coal at a price equivalent to a penny less than gravel. Hmm. Um, I mean, they were it was just ab- absolutely um, an atrocity. So, yes, it uh, it all works together, and as a matter of fact, uh, I just looked it up, and today they're still hmm. fighting over the same thing. The coal under the under the Northern Cheyenne Reservation, even today. Yeah, you, actually, what, 20, also 30 years a, later. Uh, a, um, a a boat terminal, a loading terminal, uh, right out near you, uh, in Washington State, where they are shipping the coal because they don't burn much coal in the United States anymore, so they're shipping it to China. Mm-hmm. And um, <laughs> uh, you know they have. They're digging up all the lands the um, the Crow and the other Indian reservations around there have given in. They do get more money than the uh, Northern Cheyenne, but they've got these immense bleeding pits in their land, which, mm-hmm. um, despite what anybody says, um, there really is no reclamation of strip mining. None. Mm-hmm. And uh, anybody who says so is basically lying. But again, that's two persons of reality. Um, a coal company executive will absolutely tell you, with a complete straight face, that of course they're reclaiming strip mining. Mm-hmm. It's well, you know, sorry, I'm at home and the dog is announcing a visit. That's okay. Um, that's okay. So anyway, go ahead. I, 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 I want to ask. Well, you know, we really need to talk about the uh, the characters in the book. And uh, uh, but uh, before we move on to that, uh, uh, like at Wounded Knee, the actuality of Wounded Knee in 1973, essentially, to me, it, it appears that you've got three different factions. You've got the federal government on one side. 
You've got the American Indian Movement, AIM, on another. And then there's the Guardians of the Aglala, Aglala Nation, the Goons. Uh, between the American Indian Movement and uh, the Guardians of the Aglala Nation, uh, why were they in There was, such um, in most of the Indian populations at that period, there were um, elements that had... Act, um, they, they'd they gone and decided to get on with life. They were supporters largely of Richard Nixon. They wanted uh, jobs. They wanted to to own property. Some of them gave their lands away. Um, not gave them away, but allocated them off to individuals, so that, and they ended up being sold. And there were traditionalists um, who saw the land as a religious um, you know a religious site a responsibility mm -hmm. right and did not want to become like everybody else in America even though they didn't mind becoming you know educated and whatever it was uh you know the the American government had spent almost a century you know, sending Indian children off to boarding schools where they weren't allowed to speak their native language, sending, you know, just the most abusive um, care you could possibly imagine of Indians. Uh, you know, and so most, uh, the reality was most of the tribal councils were run, um, elected um, by people who were very much in support of the government and hated the American Indian Movement, and everybody in it. And uh, after Wounded Knee, and again, this is uh, completely diametrically uh, written, uh, supporters of the American Indian Movement say that 100 to 200 uh, movement members and supporters were killed. Uh, the FBI said there was no increase in uh, homicides, and I've read a lot of articles that say that the people who died were killed by other um, AIM members. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's impossible to actually figure out in any objective way what happened, um, except Leonard Peltier is still in jail, and um, he probably shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it was a, like the Black Panthers, which were pretty systematically destroyed, the American Indian movement was seen as a danger and systematically destroyed. Mm -hmm. And now we can look back at it and say, well, you know, both of them had a good point here and there. Sure. Maybe they shouldn't have shown it that way. But it did turn out that uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the local councils were robbing the Indian people as a whole blind. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the settlement... The interim settlement, which was about 10 years ago, was $3.9 billion in monies that had been embezzled, lost, finagled out of Indian lands over the years. And that was only given out because most of the people who would benefit were dying. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's, as far as I know, that's still going on. Um, Getting back to our book, the uh, our two pr protagonists, our two primary characters, Rick Putnam and Eve, uh, they seem to have chosen sides. Uh, they have taken the sides of the American Indian movement. The book starts with them crossing the prairie carrying foodstuffs to, uh, um, right. you know, to get through the, the siege to provide food for the folks inside uh, Wounded Knee. Well, Eve Buffalo Calf, as you might guess, is a Northern Cheyenne. She's a law mm -hmm. student. She's preparing for the bar, and she. Uh, has was working with the American Indian Movement activists when they were taking over the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Washington, which is where they met. Uh, mm -hmm. Rick is about as non-political as you can get um, until somebody tries to kill him to keep mm -hmm. him something secret. And his intense loyalties, like many soldiers, are to those he's fighting with mm -hmm. as opposed to perhaps what he's fighting for. And it's more that Eve has a 
deep um, deep affiliation with the act of